Welcome to the Lunar Orbit TV transmission episode of the Rays Aerospace Commemoration of the 50th Anniversary of Apollo 11. In this video, the astronauts will transmit images of the Moon via TV starting in around 23 minutes, and that will last for a little over half an hour, after which the astronauts will proceed with preparations for another burn with the service propulsion system. The lunar orbit insertion burn brought them into a somewhat lopsided orbit, and this second burn will make the orbit more circular, though not exactly circular. That burn will occur 2 hours and 11 minutes into this video. In between all this activity, I'll continue detailing historical missions that led up to Apollo 11. As in the previous video, I'll introduce each space mission, and then there will be a brief cinematic in honor of it that will roughly depict the events of the mission set to music. This video will have far fewer of those segments than the last one though, as the astronauts are quite active. While Yuri Gagarin became the first person in space and in orbit, the United States have been preparing its own first crewed spaceflight, Mercury Redstone 3. This mission was a suborbital spaceflight, which meant it would go roughly straight up to an altitude above 100 kilometers, the international line for where space begins, and straight down instead of reaching a stable state in space and orbit. The flight would take about 12 to 15 minutes, much of which was the parachute phase on the way down, compared to the single orbit duration of about an hour and a half, and it involved propelling an astronaut only a third of the speed that Yuri Gagarin had reached. That of course allowed the use of a smaller rocket than a full orbit would require. The astronaut tasked for this mission was Alan Shepard, and he became the first American astronaut in space on May 5, 1961, about three weeks after Yuri Gagarin became the first in space. The spacecraft was named Freedom 7 by Shepard, with 7 denoting the 7 astronauts who had been selected to take part in the Mercury program. In it, he reached an altitude of 187.5 kilometers and traveled 487 kilometers downrange. Due to the short duration of the mission, there was no urine collection unit on Mercury, so when Shepard was left waiting for launch for 3 hours, he ultimately asked and received permission to urinate in his suit, a simple pressure suit not really designed for that. That mishap aside, he was able to test manual control of the Mercury spacecraft at its peak, and that was critical for the future launch of the Mercury capsule atop the larger Atlas rocket, which could bring it to orbit. On his way back down, Shepard faced a peak acceleration of 11.6 Gs. So perhaps even more than Gagarin, he had a rough ride, but he became the second human in space. There would be one more suborbital flight of Mercury, Mercury Redstone 4, carrying Gus Grissom. Vostok 2 was launched on August 6, 1961, and its goal was to see if a human could survive and operate in space for a full day. Cosmonaut Herman Titov was selected to make this vital demonstration of endurance. It seems obvious to us now, with astronauts and cosmonauts routinely staying in space for six months or more, but at the time every extension of duration was accompanied by doubt from the medical community. Sherry Gagarin had lasted one orbit, but he didn't have to eat or sleep in space, Doctors doubted the body could perform basic functions properly in a weightless environment. The decision to attempt this long flight had been a difficult one to make. In Karabal Sputnik 2, the dogs on the mission had physical issues on a six-orbit mission, 
leading to a three-orbit limit for further tests. Doctors pushed to limit Titov's flight to three orbits as well. In the end, Sergei Korolev, the mastermind of the Soviet manned spaceflight operation, decided that because it would take a day for the spacecraft's orbit to pass over the prime landing site anyway, they might as well go for it. Unlike on Gagarin's launch, Titov was placed in the correct lower orbit. He had a better transmission system as well, but the heater didn't work so well, so it got down to 10 degrees Celsius in the spacecraft during the flight. During his return, as happened with Gagarin, the re-entry capsule and the service module didn't separate cleanly until the heat and stress of re-entry broke the straps apart. This is not shown in the cinematic video. Despite that flaw, Titov made it back safely. He ejected from the spacecraft and parachuted down as Gagarin had. He did get the first bit of space sickness ever reported, some nausea after making orbit and vomit when trying to eat one of his meals. However, that passed and the demonstration was considered a success. At just under 26 years old during this mission, he remains the youngest spacefarer ever. On February 20th, 1962, about 10 months after Gagarin's flight, John Glenn launched on Mercury Atlas 6 to become the first American to reach orbit. He named his spacecraft Friendship 7. While all the Mercury astronauts were exceptional test pilots and engineers, John Glenn was an obvious choice to make the first crewed orbit for the United States. He was a Korean War hero, 
and was scrupulous about maintaining his public image. His comfort in the public eye made it no surprise when he started running for political office in 1964. There was little fear that he would handle fame badly. There were a few problems with the Mercury capsule in orbit. First, one of its thrusters started malfunctioning, so it was a bit harder for Glenn to maintain a particular orientation. On his second orbit, the spacecraft started signaling to ground control that the heat shield was no longer latched in place. As a result, they decided that he should keep his retro pack on, since that might be the only thing keeping the heat shield on the spacecraft. Eventually, the retro pack would break free during the re-entry, just as it did for Gagarin and Titov, but by that time, the aerodynamic forces would be enough to keep the heat shield on the spacecraft. In fact, the indicator was just faulty. John Glenn was recovered safely after a three-orbit flight just under five hours long. For our first uncrewed historical mission commemorated in this video and the last mission we'll talk about before the TV transmission, we have a lesser known mission called OSO-1. OSO stands for Orbital Solar Observatory and was the first solar observatory in space. Launched on March 7, 1962, 
It made early observations of coronal holes, gaps in the sun's corona that were thought to be bubbles rising through it. It was also able to detect how the sun's magnetic field activity affected the physical activity of the sun, which in turn affects Earth's own atmosphere. This has ramifications for keeping spacecraft in orbit, since when the sun is more active, Earth's atmosphere expands and satellites encounter more drag at a particular altitude. This happened to Skylab in the 1970s, as the huge station deorbited sooner than expected thanks to increased solar activity. Of course, solar activity also has implications for radiation levels. This is Apollo Control Houston at uh, 78 hours, uh, 18 minutes, uh, now into the flight of Apollo 11. Apollo 11 uh, still passing uh, the, around the far side of the moon. Uh, we're uh, less than five minutes now away from time of acquisition on uh, this, the second uh, revolution uh, for Apollo 11. The station to acquire on this pass uh, will be uh, the Goldstone Wing Site, uh, which will uh, uh, feed uh, the television uh, uh, to Mission Control Center Houston and thence uh, to all parts of the country. We would expect uh, to uh, come up with television perhaps some several minutes after acquisition, since we must first lock up uh, on the down link and uh, uh, have the uh, scan converter uh, in full operation. So at uh, 78 hours, uh, 19 minutes, uh, continuing to monitor, uh, this is Apollo Control, Houston.
Mark, uh, two minutes now from time of predicted acquisition uh, in Mission Control Center. We are standing by. Mark, one minute now from time of predicted acquisition, uh, continuing to stand by in Mission Control Center, Houston. Minus 30 pitch, Mark, 150 yards, okay. No, that's not 150, it's 15. Isn't it? Just a second. Yeah, minus, uh, I'm sorry. Standing minus by for acquisition. Minus 31 and plus uh, 15, right. You got it? Yeah. I don't know what else uh, uh, that would be at. We've had AOS uh, by yeah. Goldstone. You see what it's doing, uh, Mike? Oh. The flicker, I don't know about. The white dot is, uh, yeah. is the flicker. The television is, is uh, now yeah, on. Okay, okay, we got it. Let me do about the flicker. Apollo 11, this is Houston. Oh, God, it's on on auto. Apollo 11, are you picking up our signal? Okay. Apollo 11, this is Houston, affirmative. We're reading you loud and clear on voice. And we have a good, clear TV picture, a little bright crater in the, uh, no, 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 the bottom of the uh, picture. I guess that's the spot on the tube. That's all right, that one. And uh, if you could give us pull and accept, we'll uplink a new state vector and target load to you. Uh, 
Uh, Roger, do you have a location on that one? That was Buzz Aldrin making a report, uh, geological report on the backside pass. So we're getting a beautiful picture in down here now, 11. Uh, the color's coming in quite clearly, and uh, we can see the horizon and the, the relative blackness of space. And uh, uh, without getting into the question of grays and browns, it looks, uh, at least on our monitor, uh, sort of a brownish gray. Safely. Yeah, we're about uh, uh, 95 or 100 degrees east, uh, coming up on okay. my feet. Still holding? Okay. Uh, say again, 11. I say again, we're about 95 degrees east, coming up on my feet. Uh, Roger, and for your information, we show you at an altitude of about 92 miles above the surface right now. That's right. Uh, I'm flying it at FCS minimum impulse, Houston, and uh, it's uh, rather difficult to keep it on a constant theta. The, the limb uh, wants to wander up and down. I'm not sure in response to mass cons or I can get it completely stabilized in theta and uh, let it alone, and in another couple of minutes it will have developed its own rate. This is Houston, Roger. That was Mike Collins making their report. Hi, uh, Houston. We'll be moving shortly uh, from the side window to the uh, hatch window, and uh, we'll try and pick up some of the uh, landmarks that will be. Uh, Looking at as we approach uh, power defense. Uh, 11, this is Houston, Roger, uh, and we're through with the uplink. Computer is yours. You can go to block, and we'll have the information on nitrogen for you uh, shortly. Over. Uh, Houston, this is Houston, Roger. Ago, I was uh, exactly steady on beta, and since then uh, I have been moving toward uh, uh, the limb pointed straight down toward the radius vector, and that's been despite a number of uh, down minimum pitch impulses. Roger. Right 
to my feet, it doesn't look very much like a sea. It, uh, the area uh, which is devoid of craters, of which there's not very much, is uh, sort of a hilly looking area. It's not like a mare at all. Uh, Roger, we copy that about the sea, and it looks like uh, you were just giving us a view of the crater Dnieper, the large crater on the left, and uh, Jansky on the right. That exchange uh, between Capcom uh, Bruce McCandless and uh, Mike Collins aboard the Apollo 11 spacecraft. Uh, we think you're close, but no cigar. Apollo Control Houston, uh, we acquired TV at uh, 78 hours, uh, 24 minutes, 11 seconds. Uh, currently, uh, our orbital parameters show uh, 104. Altitude, uh, an apolune of uh, 170.2, a paralune of uh, 61.3 uh, nautical miles, those are. Uh, well, this is Houston. Uh, would you care to comment on some of these craters as we go by? Uh, Roger, we're uh, approaching uh, the uh, approach path to uh, ignition. Uh, this is equivalent to uh, 13 minutes before ignition, and uh, we're at about 80 degrees east, I guess. 83 degrees east. Does that correspond to uh, location you're holding in, uh, Brent? Uh, Roger, we're showing your present position is about uh, 77, 76 degrees east, uh, looking back towards the east. Hey, you should be looking back at the mic thing now. All right. uh, we've now heard from all three Apollo 11 crew members during this television pass. Uh, the individual talking earlier was uh, Neil Armstrong. Crater Schubert and uh, Gilbert Yu is uh, in the center right now. And this comes up at about uh, a little over 12 minutes before uh, power descent. Instead of looking, instead of looking back at it, we'd be looking straight down at it at that time. Roger. And we we'll show you an altitude now of about uh, 110 miles, and of course you'd be considerably lower at the initiation of power descent. Actually, several of them, and uh, you can observe those. Plus, the uh, 
pen graders uh, at the bottom of your screen. Uh, Roger, we're seeing the central peak quite clearly now. Okay, we're zooming in now on uh, Great Air Call Schubert N. Schubert N, uh, very conical inside wall, and the uh, bottom appears to be nearly flat. Look at data on the disk, it's stabilized and uh, is holding steady now. Roger. Looking out the window, I can see. Uh, a number of small craters on the bottom of the super den. We're coming up on the foaming sea where I'll be doing some uh, P-22 marking on a crater of my choice, name of Crater Camp. Okay, we'll be watching for camp. And notice Register 3 has reversed itself and is heading back the other way now without any uh, pitch thruster firing. Uh, Roger, Mike. Uh, we confirm that uh, you've changed the direction of your uh, pitch rate. some 17 minutes now into this television pass, uh, standing by, continuing to monitor. Okay. 
Yeah, we show you uh, over the, the sea of fertility now, and uh, I have land uh down south of the track a few degrees, about uh, 90 degrees south of the track. Yeah, the crater that's in the center of the screen now is uh, Webb. Uh, we'd be looking straight down on it at about six minutes before power descent. It uh, has a relatively flat bottom uh, to the crater, and you can see maybe uh, two or three uh, craters that are in the bottom of it. On the uh, western wall, the wall that's now nearest to, to the uh, camera, near the bottom of the screen, we can see uh, a simple crater just on the outside. And then coming back toward the bottom of the screen and to the left, you can see uh, a series of uh, depressions. Uh, it's a type of uh, connected craters that uh, give us most uh, interest to uh, discover why they're in uh, the particular patterns that they're in. I'll zoom the camera in uh, and try and give you a little closer look at this. Roger, we're uh, observing the Dimple Crater now. Uh, the central peak that we can see on the orbiter photos doesn't seem to stand out very well here. Well, they're not central peaks. They're uh, depressions in the center. Roger. Yeah, you'll notice on the uh, pitch note activity, I still I put in uh, over a dozen uh, minimum impulses and pitch down, uh, and I'm still far from correcting back 315. We're moving the camera over to the uh, right window now to give you a uh, language. This is uh, it's, uh, several central peaks. And, uh, Roger, uh, we got language in our screen now.
Target is exactly the other landing site now. some 25 minutes into our television pass. Watching this pass with a great deal of interest in Mission Control Center is uh, Pete Conrad, yeah. uh, the uh, right commander for the Apollo 12 mission. The very right edge of the screen. Sensorinus. 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 Roger, and for your information, your current altitude is uh, 148 nautical miles above the surface. I'm unable to uh, determine altitude at all looking out the window. I couldn't tell whether we were down at 60 or up at 170. I bet you could tell if you were down at 50,000 feet. So 
Roger. We can uh, observe there also, Steve, even from this altitude, you've got uh, quite a shadow being cast by the sun at these low angles.
are really accentuated by the, uh, the lengthening of the shadows as they approach the Terminator. Yes, it's a very beautiful and rugged sight that we've got on the screen now. And I think you got some interesting data on thruster firings versus uh, pitch angle. It looks like that lab just wants to head down toward the surface is all. Uh, Roger, uh, I have a comment here that says uh, that's what the limb was built for. I believe. glimpse of the lunar surface uh, during the Apollo 11 mission. Uh, the 11 crew took us on a uh, guided tour of the front side, uh, uh, plus talked their way through uh, the power descent that uh, lies ahead in tomorrow's activities. At uh, 78 hours uh, 58 minutes into the flight of Apollo 11, uh, this is Apollo Control Houston uh, continuing to monitor. Here we go on the LOI two fed. LOI two, SPS GNN three eight three two zero plus one six six minus zero eight one TIG zero eight zero one one three six zero three. Now an eighty one minus zero one four zero eight minus all balls minus zero zero seven four three roll all balls one niner six three five niner zero zero six five seven plus zero zero five three seven Delta VT, zero one five nine or two, zero one seven, zero one five three one. Sextant star, two three, one one six zero, one three eight. The rest of the pad is NA. GDC align, Vega and Deneb, two four three, one eight three. Zero one two. I'll age. Two jets. Nineteen seconds. Remarks. On your DAP load, we would like in R one two zero one zero one. Vice the value which appears in the flight plan. In making the sextant star check, this must be done between GET of seven niner. 3010, at which time the star comes above the horizon, and 795210, which is your local sunrise, due to the fact that this star is relatively close to the sun. Your burn orientation is heads down, retrograde, pitched up 28 degrees with respect to local horizontal. The calculated values for noun 42 are HA 65.6 and HP 54.6, both of those being plus. 
Uh, read back over. Roger, LOI 2, SPS GNN, 38320, plus 166, minus 081, 080, 11, 3603, minus 01408, minus all balls, minus 00743, all zeros, 196, 359, 00657, plus, Zero zero five three seven zero one five nine or two zero one seven zero one five three one two three one one six zero one three eight Vega Deneb two four three one eight three zero one two two jet nineteen seconds tap R one two zero one zero one Sexton star between 793010 and 795210. Uh, attitude is uh, heads down, retrograde, pitched up 28 degrees. HA, uh, after the burn, or was that now 42 for HA and 64 uh, decimal 6 and HP 54 decimal 6? Over. Uh, Roger, on the noun 42 values, the last stuff you gave, HA is a six five decimal six, HP is uh, five four decimal six. Otherwise, I uh, read back correct, and I'm standing by with your TEI five pad over. Roger, HA six five decimal six for noun 42, and uh, ready to copy. Eleven, this is Houston. Uh, TEI five, SPS GNN. Three seven two zero one minus zero six zero plus zero four seven TIG zero eight six zero nine er three six 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 noun eighty one plus three three five two one plus zero three four four one minus Zero one four five eight. Roll N A. Pitch zero three two. The rest of the pad is N A. All H. Two jets. One six seconds. Undocked. Over. Roger. T E I five. S P S G N N. switch in the normal position over. Roger, it's a block. Did you get us the, uh, you got us a new CSM state vector and an LOI2 target load in between all that television, didn't you? That's affirmative. And, uh, what I'm asking Thank for you. is, uh, the switch Maybe over from... telemetry switch is in normal, over. Uh, Roger, out. I hope you enjoyed the TV broadcast. The photos taken by the astronauts are obviously of better quality, but there's nothing like having them show you what they're looking at on video. The color was obviously an issue, not just on the recording, but apparently for them looking out the windows as well, 
as depending on the sun's angle, the image's tint could drastically change. We have one more update from the PAO in a couple of minutes before I'll introduce you to the next two historical missions. Uh, this is Apollo Control Houston at uh, 79 hours uh, 9 minutes and on to the flight of Apollo 11. Uh, we currently read an apolloon of 170.2 nautical miles, a paraloon of 61.2 nautical miles. Those uh, listing of figures that uh, you heard passed up to the crew uh, were maneuver pad updates. Uh, uh, the first uh, group uh, for LOI-2, uh, we're now looking at uh, a time of burn of 80 hours 11 minutes uh, 36 seconds. Uh, which should revise our orbital parameters to uh, 65.7 nautical miles by 53.7 nautical miles, a delta V of uh, 159.2 feet per second, and uh, burn duration of 17 seconds, some 17 seconds. So at uh, 79 hours, uh, 9 minutes into the flight of Apollo 11, uh, continuing to monitor, this is Apollo Control, Houston. Okay, with that, let's continue. Luna 4 was launched on April 2nd, 1963, and it was the first attempt to make a soft landing on the moon as opposed to an impactor like Luna 2 or the Ranger probes. Two previous attempts to launch this style of lunar probe had occurred in January and February of 1963, but the lunar transfer stage on the first failed to ignite, and the second didn't even reach orbit. Luna 4 reached orbit and made its transfer to the moon, but missed it at a distance of 8,336 kilometers because it failed to do a mid-course correction that it was supposed to do. After Luna 4, four more attempts either failed to make orbit or didn't make the transfer until Luna 5, launched two years after Luna 4, which ended up impacting the moon because its retro engines failed to fire. With Luna 6, the engine continued to fire during the mid-course correction, burning through all its fuel instead of stopping. Luna 7 lost attitude control right before its retroburn to land on the lunar surface, as did Luna 8. 
Finally, Luna 9 would succeed in making a soft landing on the moon, and we'll commemorate that when we get to it, but it was an arduous two years and ten months after Luna 4. Although Luna 4 was a failure, it showed that at this stage the Soviet Union was more ambitious with its lunar missions than the United States. It would take the development of the highly efficient Centaur stage for the United States to land its surveyor probes on the moon, and the use of liquid hydrogen fueled engines was a major component in the success of the Apollo missions. After six failed attempts at sending an impactor probe to the moon to take photos of the surface as it crashed into it, NASA's JPL finally succeeded with Ranger 7. The mission we will see here though is Ranger 8, which was sent to crash into the Sea of Tranquility on February 17, 1965, and took more than 7,000 photos of it in its last 23 minutes of life before it met its demise in the general vicinity of Apollo 11's landing site. Obviously, Ranger 8's photos had a direct bearing on the planning for this mission. It featured six cameras, two wide-angle and four narrow ones, in two sets. Each set of cameras had its own power and transmitters to ensure that if one set failed, the other set still had a chance. The 367-kilogram spacecraft didn't carry any other science, and it impacted the moon at a velocity of around 2,600 meters per second, or roughly 6,000 miles an hour.
Uh, this is Apollo Control Houston at uh, 79 hours, 18 minutes uh, now into the flight of Apollo 11. A uh, quiet period at this time as the Apollo 11 spacecraft continues its pass around the front side of the moon. Our uh, current altitude, uh, very close to Apollon, uh, now reading uh, 166.7 nautical miles. Our orbital parameters, uh, 170.2 by 61.2 nautical miles. Current uh, spacecraft weight in orbit, 71,622 pounds. Uh, we'll continue to keep the line up and uh, continue to monitor uh, the Apollo 11 crew, no doubt at this time uh, preoccupied, uh, very probably with the alignment of their GNN platform. At uh, 79 hours and 19 minutes into the flight of Apollo 11, uh, this is Apollo Control, Houston. Apollo 11, this is Houston, over. Go ahead, Houston. Uh, Roger, during the LOI-1 burn, uh, your engine burned a little bit more propellant than we predicted, and consequently we'd like to uh, update or send you a new TEI-4 pad, over. Okay. Our chamber pressure on board was uh, higher that time, too. It, uh, it's all on the onboard tape, the time history and the chamber pressure, but to make a long story short, it worked its way up to 100. Roger. And uh, down here we showed a chamber pressure of uh, on the order of 103 to 104 PSI during your burn on playback. Okay. Go ahead with the TGI-4. All right, your TEI-4 revised, SPS-GNN, 
38320 minus 055 plus 060 08430 2749er plus 31380 plus 03475 minus 01032 roll NA pitch 034 rest of the pad is NA LH 2 jet 1 6 seconds undocked no LOI 2 over This is Apollo Control Houston at 79 hours at 25 minutes. Uh, that uh, maneuver pad uh, that was transmitted to the crew, that uh, was uh, TEI for uh, trans-earth uh, injection burn uh, for the fourth revolution is a contingency pad only, uh, only to assure that uh, it is properly on board the spacecraft if in the end likely event uh, it should become necessary to return. Uh, at the present time uh, we read uh, an altitude of 157.7 nautical miles uh, descending uh, from Apollon at uh, this time. And our orbital parameters read uh, 170.2 nautical miles, uh, 61.2 uh, nautical miles. We're uh, some 23 minutes away at the present time from loss of signal. At uh, 79 hours, uh, 26 minutes into the flight of Apollo 11, this is Apollo Control Houston. The next mission I want to highlight on this long road to Apollo 11 is Vossod 2. The Vostok program had six missions in total, and Vossod was an interim program that was supposed to be the bridge between Vostok and the Soyuz program. Ultimately, there were only two Vossod missions. The first one was the first ever attempt to launch more than one astronaut or cosmonaut into space, and it launched three. The downside was that the spacecraft wasn't any bigger than Vostok, so they stripped out the ejection seat, added retro thrusters for soft landing on the ground, and decided the cosmonauts would not be in pressure suits because there simply wasn't enough space. The crew of Vossod 1 had to lose weight just to fit in. It was a very dangerous mission, and Vasily Mission, Sergei Korolev's second in command, called it a circus act. It scored a new space first for political points, but didn't have any practical future. They definitely weren't going to keep sending three people up on Vossod's. Vossod 2 was a different matter. It launched on March 18, 1965, with the goal of having Alexei Leonov step out of the spacecraft and perform the first spacewalk, more technically termed extravehicular activity, or EVA. Obviously, without being able to do this would limit the possibility to work in space and also to set foot on the moon. Leonov performed the spacewalk, but had trouble getting back in because they had decided to use a tunnel protruding from the spacecraft as the airlock, and his suit had inflated so that it was difficult to get back in. He actually had to let air out of his suit to fit. Despite the difficulty, this was a key achievement and not just a gimmick. This was the last crewed mission supervised by Sergei Korolev, who died early in 1966. He had managed to keep the accomplishments coming despite a shoestring budget, and with his death, the Soviet space program lost its talented operator.
There were supposed to be four more of Assad flights, all of which would have been long duration missions of more than 10 days with applications for both moon missions and the space station missions the Soviet Union would become known for. However, these flights were canceled due to political changes, which put an emphasis on speeding up the Soyuz program. While Vossad itself was quite dangerous, speeding up Soyuz would lead to the first in-flight fatality of the Soviet space program, as Vladimir Komarov dealt with numerous problems in his spacecraft Soyuz 1, only to perish due to a faulty parachute. Apollo 11, this is Houston. Patrick, go ahead, Houston. All uh, right, we've been looking at your systems data on playback, and everything is looking good. Uh, in particular, the SPS S looks good. Uh, I would like to remind you, though, of our request to perform this burn on the Bank A ball valves only, and you are go for LOI, too. Also, uh, we have... Currently in the flight plan, uh, you scheduled tomorrow to start entering the LAM at about 96 hours GET and uh, would like to know if you have any plans to initiate this uh, ingress into the LAM earlier. Uh, if so, uh, we can call the people in uh, ahead of time. Over. Well, we didn't have any plans to, no. We just wanted to be ready at that time. All right, Roger, we just wanted to make sure that uh, we were ready when you were ready. Over. Okay, and uh, to get the second star in LOI-2, uh, that's roll zero. Is that a problem? Uh, that's affirmative. Roll zero. Okay. This is Apollo Control, Houston. Uh, we're some 14 minutes away now from a loss of signal with a command and service module of Apollo 11. At uh, 79 hours, 34 minutes, this is Apollo Control, Houston, standing by.
This is Apollo Control Houston at uh, 79 hours, uh, 38 minutes uh, now into the flight of Apollo 11. Apollo 11 now uh, 130.4 nautical miles in altitude, uh, current velocity reading uh, 5,131 uh, feet per second. Orbital parameters, uh, Apolloon uh, 170.2 nautical miles with a Paralloon reading uh, 61.3 nautical miles. Apollo 11 at uh, this time uh, has completed its uh, platform alignment and is maneuvering the spacecraft uh, to its burn attitude. We're some uh, 33 minutes away now from uh, time of ignition uh, for the uh, lunar orbit insertion number two burn. And uh, we're nine minutes, 40 seconds away from uh, loss of signal uh, with the Apollo 11 spacecraft. So at 79 hours, uh, 39 minutes, this is Apollo controlled Houston. The next mission of note is the first crewed mission of the Gemini program, Gemini 3. The Gemini program would be the introduction to spaceflight for all three Apollo astronauts, but they were on Gemini 8, 10, and 12. The first test of the system went to Gus Grissom and John Young who launched on March 23, 1965, five days after Vossod 2. Grissom had worked with the Gemini engineers after his Mercury flight, and the spacecraft was largely designed around him, which was a bit of a problem for the taller astronauts as he was on the shorter side. The interior of the spacecraft was a pilot's dream rather than an engineer's, as the layout looked exactly like a two-person cockpit. This was not necessarily ideal for space missions, but the astronauts certainly appreciated it often favoring Gemini over Apollo, with the former regarded more as a sports car and the latter more like a truck. Probably the most remembered aspect of the mission was that John Young smuggled a corned beef sandwich on board and found out why this wasn't a good idea when crumbs started floating everywhere and the smell overwhelmed the air system. Otherwise, the first crude test of Gemini went smoothly.
Apollo 11 Houston, uh, five minutes to LOS. And uh, with respect to your request for the nitrogen bottle pressures pre-burn, uh, just before the burn, we were showing uh, 2270 pounds per square inch on bottle alpha and uh, 2350 on bottle bravo. Over. Apollo 11, this is Houston, uh, two minutes to LOS. Uh, your AOS on the other side is 803321, and uh, the friendly white team will see you when you come out from behind the moon. Apollo 11, Roger. Uh, make that your, you, your, your, friend, green. your friendly white team, Capcom, will see you when you come out from behind the moon. I think it's uh, basically the maroon team here, and uh, we greenies are leaving. Okay, don't blame me, Hank. No, I'd rather be up there. Another five minutes, Neil, babe. Okay. Five minutes, Mark, uh, 30 minutes, uh, 30 seconds now from predicted time of loss of signal. Standing by. Gotta get his equipment to
Apollo 11 should now be passing out of range. This is okay. Apollo Control Houston at uh, 79 hours, uh, 51 minutes, and uh, now into the flight of Apollo 11. We're some uh, 20 minutes away at uh, this time for a time of ignition for lunar orbit insertion uh, burn number two. Uh, this the uh, fine-tuned second burn in the series of two as we uh, in have inserted into lunar orbit. For uh, LOI-2, uh, the Apollo 11 uh, will be heads down. The burn uh, will be initiated uh, near Paraloon uh, as uh, the spacecraft uh, passes uh, over the far side of the moon. Retrograde uh, like LOI-1, but uh, unlike uh, Apollos 8 and 10, the burn will not be targeted to place the spacecraft into a precise circular orbit. Uh, taking uh, what was learned on Apollo 10, uh, this LOI-2 burn is designed uh, to take into account uh, uh, predicted uh, perturbations and gradually circular circularize itself. The uh, numbers that we're looking at for LOI-2, that would be time of ignition, uh, 80 hours, 11 minutes, uh, 36 seconds, which uh, should change our Orbital parameters uh, giving us an apolune of 65.7 nautical miles and a paralune of 53.7 nautical miles. The uh, delta V intended for this burn, uh, 159.2 feet per second. A burn direction, uh, duration uh, anticipated uh, 17 seconds. Uh, it's a burn of short duration, but uh, certainly important in that it establishes uh, the proper uh, orbital parameters for the uh, events that lie ahead. As uh, you 
heard an earlier conversation uh, between uh, our capsule communicator uh, Bruce McCandless and uh, two members aboard the spacecraft. Uh, we're go for LOI-2. Uh, during this burn, uh, we'll utilize only the uh, Bank A ball valve. Uh, the bank uh, referred to here, of which there are two uh, mechanisms that uh, drive mechanic. the ball valves uh, open and shut, uh, causing uh, fuel and uh, oxidizer to, to mix uh, for ignition. At the present time in Mission Control Center, uh, the last reference you heard uh, from our capsule communicator reflects that uh, they, um, on their own peculiar uh, shift schedule, are having a change of shift. Uh, astronaut uh, Charles Duke uh, has arrived on the scene, and uh, we can assume uh, we'll take over the responsibilities of uh, the uh, conversational flow with the Apollo 11 uh, spacecraft once we reacquire. At uh, 79 hours, uh, 55 minutes into the flight of Apollo 11, uh, this is Apollo Control, Houston. Now let's see, we can take across the 16mm uh, magazines and the 17mm magazines. Okay, burn time and light the motor. 17 and one second over turn almost permitted. Right here. One check. Eleven. Eighty. Eleven. Thirty-six.
There's little uh, fluorescent things on there. Must be some heat transfer. Yeah. Any command module? No. The lens? No. I don't know, it's the damage you've got a bunch of Little fluorescent uh, circles? Yeah. Mm -hmm. But there's there's some a lot of failures. The only thing with all the engineering that went into those damn things, too, is a lot of time and money down the place. I mean, this big monstrosity out here is nailed. Hey, we're coming up. That looks pretty good. Next, let's see the sun come up. Good, damn tight ruffle back here. Well, lamb is contaminated. It's got urine particles all over it. And the way the light's shining here, they look yellow. You know, a little, uh, I guess it probably is a little uh, solid. You know, the, uh, everything else is boiled off and it's left a little solid. You don't get a good view of them after this window. Solid urine particles. That's on. I guess. It'll look back contamination, the forward contamination people hear about that. Yeah. No more urine dumps on the way to the moon. <laughs> Long, nice little bag. Yeah, you're not, you got plenty of black and white film, don't you? Yeah, plenty of black and white film. Near Terminator 4. Do it as much as you want of anything you want. 80 millimeter, 250, it's all good. We got 20 minutes to pick. Oh, excuse me, 10 minutes, 10 minutes to pick. Excuse me. A little over 10. 80, uh, 11. Sure, give me a call about 7 minutes ago. Right now, mark it. Yes, yeah, sir, that there is rough, rough courage. Just have an idea how I'm going to be getting a picture of uh, all of these things. Eight minutes to pick.
Boy, there's a crater right in the side of the wall. Of a much bigger crater, and I'll be damned if it doesn't look like it just went in sideways. Hey, seven minutes. Okay. Let's do it. Buzz won't read his red checklist. We'll use my travel chart. Which checklist would you like? All right, the main bus ride is coming on. Okay? Seven minutes, Mark. AC's on? DC, huh? Uh, DVC turbo power number one, AC one? AC one. Two to AC two. AC two. Transit control power on. Translation control power on. Rotation control power normal number two to AC. AC. Rotational hand controller number two on. Number two on. For gimbal motor or two? Alright. Let's try uh pitch one yaw one. Here comes pitch one. Mark it. Got it. Yaw one. Mark it. Got it. Okay. Okay, basic controller clockwise. Clockwise. Verify no M C V C. Verify. Alright. Gimbal motor pitch two and yaw two on. Pitch two, mark it. Got it. Yaw two, mark it. Got it. Check DPI trim. Okay, what can the numbers be? 166. Um, minus 0.81. Plus 166 and minus uh, 0.81. Mm -hmm. Verify MTVC. Okay, the trim set. Some log residuals and all that. MPVC is uh, verified. Right time on. Okay. All right. Uh, Translation controller neutral. Neutral. Verified DPI returns to zero zero. Verified. Right control power number two. The right control power normal number two to ACDC. ACDC. Spacecraft control CMC verified. CMC verified. Uh, I have a needle start. Do you want to no, we don't need to. All right, speed make mode three of them at one, rate two. At one, rate two. Enter. Enter. Got a 204. Yep. Space track control CMC and auto, huh? Yep. All right. We have four minutes to stay. Okay. So, up, down, zero. No, he's straight. Up, down, zero. Which way is it shaking to you, Phil? Picture yaw. I don't know. It shows up more on a yaw needle than a pitch mm. needle, but I'm not sure that's indicative of anything except needle sensitivity. Okay, did you go to trim brightness? Yes, it did. Back off in the extra. Location control power. Direct two of them to main A, main B. Main A, main B. Yes, you mean valves, verified. Auto. Let me cycle off. Let me cycle off. SDI, CL50, 15. Okay. Uh, two minutes, A is coming on. Okay. okay. And that's all I'm going to use today. Three minutes to go. I like the neat way he's got his uh, safety belt on. 
Mark, one minute uh, until uh, planned time of ignition for LOI-2. Mike Collins uh, will be at the controls for the uh, lunar orbit insertion to burn, uh, just as he was for LOI-1. Uh, the bur burn uh, is of short duration, as we have indicated earlier, some 17 seconds of burn time anticipated. Uh, we're standing by in Mission Control Center, uh, relatively quiet. Mark, uh, 30 seconds. Continuing to monitor uh, or uh, read uh, those displays that uh, gave us our final uh, readout uh, prior to our passage uh, to the back side of the moon. Mark, uh, 10 seconds. Mark uh, five seconds. We won't know for sure how the burn uh, comes out until we reacquire. Mark, plan time for ignition. At uh, 80 hours, uh, 12 uh, minutes now to the flight of Apollo 11. Uh, this is Apollo Control, Houston.
66.1 by 54.4. Now you can't beat that. Now that's versus it's like uh, downtown. This is 65.7. Now we're more elliptic now. That's about as close as you can get. Yeah, I bet we never get Okay, you got any more uh, circuit? I mean, any more switches for me? No. When, okay. uh, when everybody happy. likes this one, uh, why don't you try uh, verb 83 or uh, verb 66 or uh, Let's see how much it says we put in. Hundred and fifty eight. Fifteen point eight, huh? Hundred fifty. All right. Okay. Are happy with that? Reasonable. Sixty-six. Vote on the verb sixty-six. Go. Everybody in favor of verb sixty-six? Yeah. Raise your right arm. Check it again. Well, let's see. We didn't gain any on the old plugs that time. You're right. We probably never will. No, it's really. That that thing up to increase as soon as it's Expect to increase that time? Huh? Expect to increase that time? It's going to stay increasing now. Huh? Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> but I waited for it to start an upward trend on the first burn. Understand. That's all right. Uh, you can maintain our brake? Yeah, I guess so. It's going to be sort of a pass-through our brake kind of thing because see, if I whip, do it in a hurry, if i I got to pitch down 80 degrees, stop the pitch, or stop almost all of it, except for the our brake amount. That's going to wait till what it gets. Do we have to do anything? Uh, do that O2 to pressurize the lamp? No, we got it uh, small enough. Yeah. 
is observed in lunar surface. That's what it's saying we are supposed to be doing. Brown, it's brown. Brown all around. Well, no doubt which way that little crater hit. Here's that same one uh, going by again, uh, Neil. Remember uh, that right job? you're looking at by moving your head to a different spot in the window. And looking in a different direction.
How's our roll doing, Neil? Oh, you got about 30 degrees to go. Oh, boy. Okay. How far are you roll? Over and over. Yeah, just a tiny bit. So it's not uh, it's rather uh, interesting to see some of this dump going straight in polar orbit. Wonder how long it's going to take before it impacts. But obviously, it's not really in polar orbit. It's going on top. Yeah. Yeah, it's inclined to this more angle. Yeah, that's right. It's going straight out there, though. That's real funny. Better like that. That one's got a little, little curve on it. Would you believe that, man? One went out and curved around like that. I guess it's just going to be another party thing. No, 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 no. It's a curve. It had a little bubble in it that uh, came to the surface and went kapoom. Uh, and there's the atmospheric drag up here. Departed it with a little delta V. I think what's really happening is uh, we're rolling and uh, it's changing the angle. I'm looking out the window. Down in the Yeah, we can't stop right here and observe the Earth come up. Well, we got to get that picture one time. We probably can't do it. We could stop it right here if you want to spend the gas. Yeah, it's going to trouble with our own gas. What do you think? Looking out over the limb as well. Okay. Shouldn't be a bad picture. Why don't we stop it? Okay. See, we ought to be able to get. 
get high gain from the data breach. Yeah, that's right. We ought to get the long lens on, right? Yeah, we ought to get the 250. We ought to get the 250. We got four minutes. Are we good enough out there? I hope so. We are out this window, babe, but we're not out that. And if the earth is right there, that's where it's coming up, huh? Better be. You want color? Uh. You better have color. Yeah, you want color? There it is. I got a clean window over here, so don't sweat that too much. Probably over there on the shelf. We got back blood in the end, back in the wall. The straighter didn't look pasty in the uh, back end. Like big chunks of white stuff and just plump down. We don't get too far over here. We may have to watch our picture angle. We're good right now. This is stabilized. Or break? No, we're not on break. We're going to be coming on break at it. Yeah. Yeah, I guess we've got the shed and then, uh... Okay. Mark, uh, two minutes uh, from time of predicted acquisition of the Apollo 11 spacecraft. Uh, during this upcoming pass, uh, we'll have our second excursion on the part of the Apollo 11 crew into the into the lunar module. The limb uh, is to be pressurized uh, by a valve in the tunnel hatch. And uh, as a point of interest, we'll remain uh, pressurized uh, following uh, uh, this period of activation uh, and after the uh, members of the Apollo 11 crew uh, return to the command module. Uh, for this period of activation, it's definitely planned that uh, a buzz will go into the limb and uh, there is a distinct possibility that uh, Commander Neil Armstrong could could exercise his option and go into the limb. Our station uh, to acquire, um, as we come around the far side of the moon, uh, will be Goldstone. Mark uh, one minute from predicted time of acquisition, and uh, we're standing by. 150. I'm good. You don't want to take too many on this. No. I'm going to put the other one back on. I was just going to say that for the next guy. Yeah, wow. Mark, uh, 30 seconds. Mark, 10 seconds from predicted time of acquisition. I'm not really sure what you're looking at. But there's a mighty big red block down in that area. Like uh, somebody's painted white paint. 
vertically down the edges. And then Goldstone has uh, acquired uh, Apollo 11. This is Apollo Control Houston uh, standing by at uh, this time at uh, 80 hours uh, 35 minutes. Line 67 zero. Okay, Auto. Medium. There we go. Both Goldstone and Hawaii have acquired a signal. Uh, we will. Okay, we got standing by. Over. Thank you, Roger Houston. Um, burn status report follows. Delta take zero. Burn time seventeen. Uh, angles with the pad values. Delta B DX was plus point three. BGY minus point zero. BGZ minus point one. Delta BC minus five point two. Fuel three six two. Ox three six four. Unbalanced plus fifty. And our post burn now ninety fours. Sixty six point one by fifty four point four. Go ahead. Uh, Roger, we copy, Neil. Uh, would you say again the Delta VZ? We missed that. Over. Roger, that was minus point one. Roger, copy the burn report. Sounds good. Get all look it up here. Houston, uh, we missed your uh, Delta TIG and also your Delta burn time, over. Delta TIG was zero and the burn time was 17 seconds. Copy, 17. Uh, you heard that report uh, from Commander Neil Armstrong indicating uh, that uh, LOI-2 was all came off almost precisely as planned. Houston will be satisfied if you pump up the cabin to 5.4, over. Okay, we're showing about 5.2 right now. Roger. Our next historical space mission is Intelsat-1, which was launched on April 6, 1965, and it became the first commercial communication satellite 
in a geosynchronous orbit, which is an orbit that allows a satellite to stay roughly above the same spot on the surface. Geosynchronous and geostationary orbits take nearly as much effort to get to as the lunar orbit, so this was no mean challenge. Intelsat's namesake operator was the International Telecommunications Satellite Organization, which had been established by 11 countries in 1964 to provide shared communication satellites. Intelsat was privatized in 2001, in which state it continues operations today. Nicknamed Early Bird, Intelsat 1 was wildly successful, operating for three and a half years instead of its intended 18 months. It only had a mass of 34.5 kilograms and 40 watts of power, but it participated in some of the most famous broadcasts of all time. The first was the Our World broadcast, the first global television event, which aired on June 25, 1967. For two and a half hours, 19 countries participated in providing live programming, everything had to be live, and around half a billion viewers tuned in to watch. The most famous segment had the Beatles singing All You Need Is Love for the first time. The song was written specifically for the Our World broadcast. After its three and a half year run, Intelsat 1 was reactivated to participate in another major broadcast event, assisting with communications during the Apollo 11 mission because another satellite had failed. There weren't many satellites available to relay communication to and from Apollo 11. Most of it was handled by ground stations, but Intelsat was among the satellites helping out. It would be revived one more time in 1990 for its 25th anniversary. Among early satellites, which lasted weeks or maybe months, its longevity was astounding, and the Hughes Space and Communications Company which built it would become the major player in the commercial satellite business, building 40% of commercial satellites in service in the year 2000 when the company was purchased by Boeing. Apollo 11, Houston, over.
Hello, Apollo 11, Houston, over. Uh, this is Apollo Control, Houston. Need, uh, please attempt to acquire on a high gain. Uh, we're having trouble locking up on the TM and we have no voice. Over. Uh, this is Apollo Control, Houston. Uh, you copied that report. Uh, we're standing by for uh, Apollo 11 spacecraft to acquire on the high gain antenna. Meanwhile, um, Onboard readings on orbital parameters were 66.1 nautical miles by 54.4 nautical miles. Very close to, very close to the planned uh, altitudes uh, that were predicted uh, prior to the LOI-2 burn. At 80 hours, uh, 46 minutes, uh, continuing to monitor, uh, this is Apollo Control, Houston. I'm going to introduce the last historical mission for this video here, even though two bits of communication will occur before the cinematic video. Gemini 4 was launched on June 3, 1965 with a goal of having Ed White step outside of the Gemini spacecraft and perform the first EVA, the first spacewalk, for the United States. This was actually supposed to happen on a later Gemini mission, but with the Soviet Union already nabbing the first EVA with Voshod 2, NASA decided to speed up the timeline and move the EVA to this mission. Ed White's EVA had some complications, but not in the same way as Leonov's did, because White didn't have to fit through an airlock tunnel, the whole spacecraft was depressurized and the hatch above his seat opened, and he could also get help from crewmate James McDivitt. The main problem was that the latch mechanism on the hatch acted up and was threatening not to close properly. McDivitt eventually got it shut. Reentry did not go as planned because of a computer failure requiring the astronauts to spin stabilize the craft through reentry instead of using the normal lifting reentry profile, but nevertheless they were recovered safely and promptly. Hello, Apollo 11. Apollo 11. Roger, we're reading you five by. Go ahead, over. Oh, Roger, we can have you on high gain now. All right, uh, we lost a TM and a voice for about five minutes here. We were uh, attempted a handover and uh, fouled it up in some manner, but we got you back now. Thank you much. Okay, we're uh, pressurizing the limb at this time. Uh, copy. Uh, this is Apollo Control Houston, 80 hours, uh, 48 minutes now into the flight uh, of Apollo 11. Uh, very preliminary uh, ground readings indicate an apolloon of 65.6, uh, paralloon 53.7.
Hello, Apollo 11. Houston, we have a, a T-22 auto optics update for you if you're ready to copy over. Ready to copy. Uh, Roger, Mike. It's the landmark uh, Alpha 1, T-1, 8 2 3 7 3 5 T2 is 8 2 4 2 5 0 We're 7 miles north over Yeah, copy, uh, P-22, uh, T-1 time, 82, 37, 35, T-2, 82, 42, 50, and the target is 7 miles north. Thank you. That uh, was passed up to uh, Mike Collins, uh, the command module pilot, uh, who will occupy himself uh, during this uh, pass on the, over the front side uh, uh, with uh, landmark tracking activities. At 80 hours, uh, 53 minutes uh, into the flight Apollo 11, uh, we continue to monitor. It's a distinct impression, Charlie, that uh, Mari surface laps up over the uh, edge of the mountains at the shoreline. Roger, we copy. This is Apollo Control Houston at uh, 80 hours, uh, 56 minutes uh, now into the flight of Apollo 11. Our current velocity reading uh, 5,334 feet per second. Current, current uh, weight of the spacecraft in orbit, uh, 70,505 pounds. Uh, Houston, on your comment about the uh, Mari uh, lapping up to the uh, uh, terrain, uh, mountainous terrain, uh, is that uh, an impression like a uh, lava flow uh, uh, coming in around a, uh, a prominent uh, needle, or does it more look like it's uh, sloping up at, at that point? Over. Uh, 
it isn't uh, true everywhere, but uh, there are certainly places where uh, there seems to be a slope downward toward the shoreline on the Mare. In other words, from the Mare down to the shoreline is a downward slope, uh, indicating that uh, might be a lava front. Roger. That uh, was Commander uh, Neil Armstrong talking uh, to our capsule communicator, Charles Duke. Our current uh, orbital readings uh, show an apaloon of 65.5, a uh, paraloon of uh, 53.7 nautical miles. At uh, 80 hours, uh, 58 minutes into the flight, uh, we continue to monitor, and this is Apollo Control Houston. Okay, so that just about wraps it up for this video. And for next few videos, there won't be any commentary from me. Obviously, from the PAO, there will continue to be very good commentary. The astronauts continue to check things out for the next few videos and then turn in for the night. I'll be back with you for the landing initialization in the video starting at hour 100. The undocking occurs at 100 hours and 12 minutes, descent orbit insertion at 101 hours and 36 minutes, and the landing at 102 hours and 45 minutes. Thank you for watching the Race Aerospace commemoration of the 50th anniversary of Apollo 11.